Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Patton. I'm an orthopedic surgeon with Western Kentucky Orthopedics and Graves Gilbert Clinic. Thank you for joining me. I'm here today to talk about hip and knee replacement and answer some of the various questions that I often get asked in the office. When someone comes in with a hip or a knee complaint, we will evaluate the patient, take x-rays, and discuss the various issues that they're having. Primarily, that's obviously some pain associated with these issues and then functional problems such as difficulty walking, bending, popping, etc. And then usually with x-rays and sometimes other imaging, we can determine what the problem is. Very commonly, that is due to arthritis, which as we age tends to become more uh, of an issue. And so initially the treatment for arthritis is not to have a joint replacement first, but to try other measures, whether that be arthritis pills, uh, arthritis creams, sometimes exercises or physical therapy is helpful, uh, occasionally a brace, say for a knee problem, injections can be helpful, um, and other types of techniques there. In fact, one of the questions that I've been asked more lately is regarding certain injections other than the typical cortisone injections that we do, and those are called stem cell injections. That's a fairly common topic now, and stem cell injections have gotten uh, a lot of interest in the last few years because they're a newer technique, but as of yet, still fairly unproven for arthritis. It's not regulated by the FDA, who controls various interventions and medicines. And so for right now, I think the jury is still out on whether stem cells will be helpful here. You may hear them in discussion about rejuvenation of joints, restoring joints, but unfortunately there is no definitive evidence that they actually regrow cartilage in the knee when someone has arthritis, or in the hip for that matter. So we try various options as much as possible, and then unfortunately arthritis tends to gradually progress. That's the natural history of this. And as things worsen then, people typically become less happy with uh, their function in pain and as a result then we have to start thinking about a surgical approach when all else fails and usually that revolves around a joint replacement and so today we'll talk about hip and knee replacements specifically. A big question is at that point is when patients say well look when do I really know that it's time to have a hip replacement or a joint or a knee replacement and typically, uh, I'll summarize the various options and things that we've been through, go through with the patient what their limitations are. Many of the patients have night pain problems, they're having trouble working, or at times they just feel like their knee or hip is unstable, as if they might even fall. And those are typically the patients who are the happiest after joint replacement because they've gotten, unfortunately, functionally pretty bad. And that's where we can make a big difference with joint replacement. So that's when we start talking about pulling the trigger on surgery, and I think that's the most appropriate time for people. Once we do um, talk about uh, joint replacement, lots of people want to know, well, what are these made of? What does a joint replacement look like? And so most joint replacements these days are made of a combination of titanium, uh, alloy, and a special type of plastic, and some also contain a ceramic bearing as well. So this is a model of a knee replacement. And as you can see, I'll lay it over my own knee here. This is how this works. Basically, you have a model of the femur bone or thigh bone, the shin bone called the tibia, that now, instead of the bones rubbing together, they are covered with metal implants that are stuck in place. And then in between the two metal is a piece of plastic. And so, like the knee, it bends back and forth, and then also has a bit of rotational component with the particular knee replacement that I use to help mimic more natural knee biomechanics. The one thing you'll notice not on this model is the kneecap, which sits here in the front. And they didn't include the kneecap on this model because it's a bit unstable to play with. But in any event, as you can see, the way we get these in here are to separate the bones during the surgery. And we actually 
cut the bone and mill it. And then this piece, in some instances, is glued in place. In some, we actually have cementless varieties. And then once we've capped either bone, we put this special plastic piece that goes in between. And again, we have various sizes of these things. And then we basically put it back together. You'll notice these uh, rubber bands that are holding the model together. These represent the ligaments on the knee. These are not actually used um, during the surgery. But this is how it works. And because of that then, the bones aren't rubbing together and that's how it alleviates pain. All right, so this is a model of a hip replacement. And essentially what this represents, the clear portion is the pelvis. It's the left hip, if you will, as if it was my hip. And the other clear portion here represents your thigh bone. And then as you can see, in between the two is the socket. It's got a metal shell inside with a plastic liner. And then the femur may be a little more difficult to tell, but it has a metal stem inside the femur, roughly five inches or so long. And then on top of that is ceramic or metal ball. And there's certain reasons why I use one versus another. But those come together and that's what forms a hip replacement. And then, of course, there's more flexibility through the hip than is on this model. If I take it apart, it tends to be a bit unstable, but by moving it around, you can see no longer are the bones touching one another. And again, that's how it alleviates pain. So now that we've seen the models of the hip replacement and knee replacement, we need to talk about getting you as the patient ready for surgery. Typically, there are certain things that we need to go over from a medical standpoint unrelated to your arthritis and make sure that you optimize your medical health so that we do the surgery as safely as possible and it makes your recovery as easy as possible. And so we like to ask patients about their medical conditions specifically related to whether you have diabetes or not, and we certainly want that diabetic control as tight as possible. We like to ask patients not to smoke for at least a month before their surgery, because we know that smoking doubles your risk for infection. We like to make sure that your blood count is satisfactory, you don't have any active heart or lung problems going on, and a few other things that we screen for with lab tests and, and the like. Um, if possible, we also like for patients to lose some weight, particularly before surgery, so that they can understand that it's easier to recover, get up and move, and that also reduces risks for wound healing, etc. If you're of normal weight, that really doesn't apply. Um, so there's various things there that we like to optimize, if you will, to make sure that it's the easiest process possible and as safe as possible because we want to hopefully prevent every complication we can. In doing so, we also need to get you ready with equipment for surgery. And most people with knee and hip replacements need to use a walker after surgery. We have those here in the office if you don't have one and you know, can equip you. You'll use that when you go home from the hospital for a while, typically anywhere from two, maybe up to four weeks, depending on the patient. Um, sometimes people then will need a cane as time goes along and occasionally people need an elevated toilet seat to help. But those are things that we can individualize as we need. And then once you've decided on proceeding with surgery, we schedule that and I give you then a copy of what I call a surgery manual. And for both hip and knee replacements, I've created about a 10 page uh, folder. It's sort of a surgical guide, if you will, that I sat down and went through and basically now that I've done this for 20 years, uh, it's something that I've found is, I think, helpful for patients to read before their surgery so that it answers various questions that they may have that perhaps they forget to ask me in the office or also answers questions that they have after surgery once they get home. Helps to guide them if you have any problems and it's got lots of phone numbers for people to call and, and whatnot to help you along to make you realize uh, you know, you're not alone when you get home. There's always uh, someone to help. So I think this is a good guide for patients. I have one for both hip and knee replacements and 
Um, and I've gotten good feedback on that over the last year or so. So once we've scheduled surgery, um, then we also have to arrange for you to go to the hospital a few days before your surgery for a pre-op session. And that's where you get to talk to the anesthesia doctors and they want to get to know who you are, what medical conditions you have, etc. They also will draw some lab work, uh, blood work that is, and usually do um, a heart test called an EKG just to make sure your heart is in the right rhythm. We want to screen for all of those things and we know that increases the safety of the procedure. And while you're at the hospital, we generally also arrange for you to do what's called a joint class. And a joint class basically is talking with our orthopedic nurse navigator and watching a short video. And that helps to go through various things, what you'll encounter the day of the surgery, and also what to prepare for at home for when you're discharged from the hospital. And it's just trying to get everything optimized before the actual surgery. And we found that um, that makes this whole process easier. You will arrive usually fairly early in the morning at the hospital. Um, we'll talk about some of the coronavirus issues that we've implemented at the hospital. I'll mention that a little bit later, but essentially the nurses, nursing staff will get you ready, start an IV, and then begin to um, you know, ask you the various questions that we need to ask but then also give you a few pills to take that are actually some pain relieving pills in anticipation of having um, surgery. And then you'll be moved down to the area in the operating room where we get you ready for uh, meeting all the operating room staff. Then you're ultimately ready to have surgery, but just prior to that, um, our anesthesia staff will talk to you. And generally we recommend using spinal anesthesia if we can because we know that spinal anesthesia is more effective, um, it's safer, and generally people wake up from that faster. And it's definitely a better way of having hip or knee replacement than having to put you all the way to sleep, which involves generally a tube down your throat. Uh, we find that people wake up faster, they have less nausea. Now some people have concerns about spinal anesthesia because they think they're going to be awake since we only numb your waist and legs with a spinal. Um, but that's not true. We actually give you medicine through your IV and it lets you take a nap so you don't have to be aware of anything that's going on. But the good thing is, is you're still breathing for yourself and you don't have to have a tube, which tends to be irritating. Once the spinal anesthesia is administered, we take you back to the operating room and then that's where we actually proceed with the surgery which on average takes roughly an hour depending on the patient and uh, what's going on. It's one of the techniques that I've adopted in the last year or so is called tourniquet-free knee replacement. And so traditionally um, in orthopedic surgery, we will often use a tourniquet on a leg or arm when we work on uh, various areas of the leg or arm doing surgery. And knee replacement has been one of those operations where we would traditionally use a tourniquet. And the idea with the tourniquet, as you might imagine, is to inflate the tourniquet, squeeze the leg, and that helps to minimize or eliminate blood flow during the operation. It does make the surgery easier. But unfortunately, we know that after a while, that tourniquet becomes a pain generator. And if you've ever had your blood pressure taken on your arm, after that's been inflated for a few seconds, it does start to hurt. And you can think that a tourniquet has to squeeze even tighter than that. And imagine that being in place for anywhere from 45 minutes to over an hour. And that causes a lot of pain. It also squeezes the muscle hard and causes some inflammation and weakness to that muscle that can last sometimes for several days. So about a year ago, I stopped using tourniquets and now use a couple of uh, devices in the operating room that helps me to minimize blood flow or blood loss, I should say, during the surgery by coagulating all the tiny little bleeders as I go along. So it's a more meticulous surgery. It takes me a, a little bit longer, maybe five to 10 minutes, but I think it's definitely worth it when it comes to pain relief and also function after surgery. So in other words, you don't get the tenderness and the weakness in your thigh muscle. You can bend the knee easier. You can get up and move faster. And that, as a result, 
has eliminated the need to use a brace on your knee after surgery, which prior to that was required in order to stabilize the knee so that your knee didn't give way because of that weak muscle. So we've eliminated the pain from the tourniquet, we still control the blood loss, um, and then you don't have to wear a brace after surgery and you can get up and move faster. So I think it's a win-win for everyone. After the surgery, you'll then end up in the recovery room and spend an hour or so with the recovery room nursing staff. They'll make sure everything looks stable and then send you upstairs ultimately to the orthopedic floor where then soon thereafter, a physical therapist will begin to get you up and start walking using the walkers there at the hospital. We know that early walking and movement of your knee and hip joint is good for you, reduces the chance for blood clots, pneumonia, and other types of issues, and frankly, gets you up and moving faster so you can get out of the hospital faster. Hip and knee replacements in the past have gotten a bad rap as far as pain management, and rightly so, simply because in the past, we've had less options to use to help with that. Uh, nowadays, there are lots of different things that we use, and that's why we call this pain management program multimodal pain relief. And that involves medicines that we give to you before the surgery, uh, two or three pills, uh, the spinal anesthesia itself. During the surgery, right before we close the incision, I actually inject numbing medicine around the knee or hip area to reduce pain. We use a cold pack or ice on the operative site to reduce pain and swelling. And then we also provide medications, sometimes through the IV and sometimes by mouth, um, to help augment pain relief as well. And most people do very nicely with that. Um, so pain management has gotten a lot better in the last few years where we've really focused on that and had more options to use than say 10, 15 years ago. I typically come early in the morning, the day after your surgery, check on you and make sure things are progressing. And then about 90 to 95% of my patients will then go home the next day rather than spend the night um, further in the hospital. You know, it used to be when I started 20 years ago, people would spend three, four, five nights in the hospital and then end up going to a rehab facility. And pretty much the paradigm has changed. We pretty much advocate going home from surgery and from the hospital rather than to a rehab facility any longer. Particularly now that coronavirus is an issue, I like for my patients to be at home, away from other patients if at all possible. And I think that's a safer way of doing it and it's been proven to be safe where we can treat you at home better and just as well as if you went to a rehab facility. But what that does mean is you have to have generally family or friends available for a few days who can attend to you if you need something. But again, you're gonna be up and moving and walking on your own at home using that walker. So this is something that now is pretty much the standard of care anymore rather than going to a rehab facility. And I think that's great and, and frankly it's good for our society. We'll save money that way, but more importantly, it's just easier and you don't, that way you don't have to go spend the night in someone else's bed at a rehab facility. For a lot of patients, uh, home therapy helps to first get you started. It's a bit of a convenience for the first week or two. However, I'm becoming more aggressive in getting patients to come to our office or one of their local physical therapy offices and getting started on early therapy as an outpatient. And I think that's good in more than one way. Uh, psychologically, it gets you out of the house and um, avoids that cabin fever, but then also uh, physically, I think it's good to be around other people and get a little more aggressive therapy um, to help get you moving along and, and get you better faster. Uh, but those options both exist and we can discuss that individually uh, when you see me or, our, or after the surgery and get that arranged. That physical therapy then continues for a few weeks. Uh, it's different for different people. There's no set amount of time, but ultimately the physical therapist and myself can come to an agreement about how long you need and then once everyone is in agreement that you're doing well enough, you can continue that therapy on your own by yourself. General recovery time is different for different people, but on average, 
my typical uh, time period is roughly three months. Knee replacements tend to take a little longer than hip replacements to recover from. Knees tend to hurt a little bit more, it seems. They have, uh, tend to have a little more swelling and some other factors. So if you need a knee replacement rather than hip, you have to work a little harder there. Uh, but generally within three months, most people are ready to go back to work. And some people can actually go back to work several weeks before that, depending on the type of job that they have. Driving is also an issue. In general, uh, with a left hip or knee replacement, I'll allow people to drive in the first couple, or after the first couple of weeks. And then with a the right side uh, hip or knee replacement, I usually recommend four weeks or so. Some people need six before they're ready. One of the biggest questions for joint replacement is how long do they last? Um, the goal, as you might imagine, uh, in orthopedics is to hopefully make a patient's joint replacement last the rest of their life. Uh, but that's dependent upon a lot of factors. In particular, one of the factors is how old is the patient when they have it to begin with. So we like to do everything we can to push a patient uh, as far as they can before they have surgery. Um, but ultimately, patients who are in their 50s, 60s, and certainly 70s are certainly good candidates for joint replacement. Because we think that these will last anywhere from 20 to 25 years with a 90% success rate. So those numbers have definitely gotten better since I first started doing orthopedics 20 years ago. And we know that there's a reason for that. And part of the reason has to do with how we put the joint replacement in, but we also have learned a lot in the last 25 years about how to make the knee replacement and hip replacement work better. The metals, the plastics, and so the engineering going into these things has improved very dramatically. So we've learned a lot, and I think that uh, at this point we're doing a very nice job. Now, all of the joint replacements that I put in currently, um, obviously they will take, it will be quite some time before we know how long they last, but the goal ultimately is to make them last for anyone the rest of their life. So another big question that people like to know is what uh, can I do after a joint replacement? Do I have restrictions, etc.? And really there are only a couple uh, and those include running or jogging and then repetitive jumping. So those types of activities tend to have a sudden forceful impact on the joint replacement and there is concern that that, that forceful jarring repetitively could damage the implants either by loosening them or rarely causing them to crack or break. That's very uncommon, but primarily coming loose. And for that reason, we recommend that you avoid that. Everything else, such as walking, treadmill, elliptical, bicycle, bowling, golfing, regular dancing, swimming, etc. Um, skiing even for some patients. Those are all allowed and frankly encouraged because that's ultimately why we do the procedure is to keep you active. With knee replacements, uh, some patients, particularly men it seems, are concerned about kneeling on the knee um, and that I do allow. I will admit some patients do have tenderness because of the scar being in the front of the knee and they have to use a pad or um, some type of cushion there and that does help. The occasional patient has trouble kneeling no matter what. Um, so it is allowed but not always um, predictable from patient to patient. Our goal is to make joint replacements last the rest of your life. But what would happen if for whatever reason the joint replacement wore out or came loose before you passed away? And ultimately, um, the answer to that is that we can perform what's called revision surgery. We can revise the implants with other specialized implants that we have available that have been designed over the years to help aid us in taking out the other implants and putting new ones in. Um, those implants, obviously, we would love to never have to use but we know that some patients have to have them for various reasons. But it is uh, a viable option and can be very effective. So it is possible to redo a joint replacement 
um, but hopefully that never has to happen. We like, if at all possible, to avoid revision surgery by hopefully doing a one and done surgery. Revision surgery is associated with overall good outcomes, but probably not quite as good as the original knee replacement or hip replacement itself. And that's because of a variety of different factors. Um, and so if at all possible, we try to do everything as complication free as possible to avoid that. If you come into our office or certainly into the hospitals these days, you'll see everyone wearing masks, screening, using alcohol, hand sanitizer, washing your hands, etc. All of that is very important to try to minimize spread of coronavirus. For a while here in Kentucky, we were restricted from doing elective surgery. And that included, included really any orthopedic surgery, joint replacements and the like. But then once we got more of a handle on the virus and figured out what to do and how to more safely interact uh, with one another, both our office and the hospitals now have instituted a variety of screening measures and preventative measures to try and avoid um, transmission of the virus. And so we have found that over the last uh, few months now that we've had a successful return to the operating room to begin doing knee and hip replacements once again. It should be known that here in Kentucky, you do have to have a coronavirus test a few days before your surgery. We arrange that for you. There are a few things we have to do at the hospital on the day of your surgery and while you're in the hospital. Um, but fortunately, you're able to have a visitor to be with you, uh, such as family member or spouse, and uh, we can get through this despite the coronavirus. Um, obviously, once a vaccine becomes available, that will make life even easier for everyone. But I feel strongly that we can help you despite all of the coronavirus issues. It just takes a little more effort on everybody's part. So I hope that uh, the last few minutes have been helpful uh, with the explanations that I've given about knee and hip replacements. Um, these are the various questions and issues that have come up repeatedly over the years that uh, patients tend to focus on most. Obviously, uh, it doesn't include every answer to every question, and I certainly look forward to answering those individually with you in the office if you need help. Both myself and a variety of my other partners at Graves Gilbert Clinic Western Kentucky Orthopedics treat patients with hip and knee replacements. I think we have a nice track record of taking care of those patients here locally at either hospital here in town. Uh, we have established protocols with up-to-date technology that you would see anywhere else around the country. And so I think that we can provide excellent, good quality care um, and keep track of those types of statistics uh, because I want to bring the best to Bowling Green and uh, would love to discuss those options and opportunities with you.